So good morning, everyone. I'm Dave Novak, uh, director of the Weather Prediction Center, and I'll be chairing this session to make sure we make it to lunch around 1230. And so uh, we have a, a couple of different uh, presentations here. And first up is uh, Jeff Domingo. So Jeff, take it away. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving along with the EMC branches, I'm the Mesoscale Modeling Branch Chief. Um, and I'm representing a large group of the branch members and the contractors and colleagues that contribute, not named specifically. Uh, these are the topics I'm going to cover, uh, accent on briefly, since we're consolidating a lot of things into one talk. Uh, this is not going to be death by PowerPoint, I hope. Uh, so uh, moving on, I'm gonna, I want to leave myself some time to cover the a plan that I have that as a proposal, it's not been ratified by the, uh, what is it, the MDC, the council, uh, but it's, it's out there, it's been discussed before. Uh, it'll look familiar to some of you, if not many of you. Uh, so I'm gonna start with the uh, air quality program. Implementation was in January. It was the first one in a while. Uh, they brought in the CBO5 mechanism uh, amongst other things, um, and did some work on the PM, particulate matter, small stuff. Uh, and then moving on to the upcoming implementation that's going to be taking place soon, uh, where the PM will be put in. Uh, the observations here are in black, and the parallel system is in red, and the operational system is in blue. But you can see uh, we're moving much closer to the observation. We still have a ways to go, and that is being addressed through a bias correction scheme. Uh, and similarly, this is a diurnal cycle plot. Uh, and again, we have we've moved from uh, we're moved closer to the observation trace. Um, and we'll be also incorporating. Uh, again, this is a multi-agency uh, effort. So we're bringing in the, from the Forest Service. The blue sky emissions and also working with Canada's, uh, with Environment Canada to get uh, additional emissions. Uh, moving on to the RCMA IRMA, which was implemented last year, uh, upgrade implemented in April. Um, we are working on a large uh, package to bring in max min temperature. This is associated with the National Blend project from Sandy Supplemental that's targeted to go in early calendar year 16. Uh, and then we'll be moving on to beyond that uh, to do to add in uh, cloud ceiling height and sea level pressure probably uh, upgrade the background to to the upgraded her version two and the NAMRR, uh so we have less downscaling to do for the background uh, and uh, then in early 17 we're also planning uh, we're, we're trying to get two updates per year for the RTMA Irma as requested by the field. Um, and we're working to bring in uh, an expanded domain that covers uh, a little bit more of the offshore area for OPC. Uh, we've been asked, and, and I guess we'll have to go through the requirements process here for the FAA, by the FAA, to produce a 15-minute update uh, for ceiling and visibility, which supports uh, the helicopter and emergency medical services system through AWC. And moving on to the high-res window, this was updated in September, and what will likely be the last update to high-res window, uh, there is a website here for a new product, high-resolution ensemble forecast, and an example here of a probability of reflectivity greater than 30 dBZ from that website. Um, this system was up right. some minor changes to vertical structure uh, and some tweaks to the microphysics to help with uh, uh, the uh, Echo Top product used by AWC. And here is a schematic of how we construct the high-resolution ensemble forecast time lag-based uh, ensemble. Eventually, hopefully in 17, if my plan is accepted, uh, we'll have an ensemble of its, for its own right. Uh, and then we can turn the high-res window off. Uh, moving on to the SHREF, which was also implemented fairly recently. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, this is now a two-model, two-core system. Uh, we dropped the WARF NMM, so we're left with just the uh, WARF ARW and the NMMB, which is part of them. Uh, and there's a website here if you want more details. Uh, let's move on for the sake of time. Uh, 
this system will be recycled in the in my plan. Uh, the wrap at, the wrap version three and the her version two. Uh, here's the her domain and the wrap. The old wrap domain is in red. The new wrap domain is in white. And this maps into a common domain for Shref work, uh, so we can. We don't have to fill in around the edges for using the wrap initial conditions to uh, in the Shref members. Uh, and the updates here, okay, I'm not sure where that came from. Didn't re notice that before. But the, this upgrade is targeted for early May. The hope is to get in by the bulk of the severe weather season because uh, the targeting of these changes, a lot of it is to produce uh, an improved uh, low-level boundary layer, which is currently dry and too warm, which is not so good. Uh, this is also in the future planning slide from Stan. Uh, the green things are, don't show up so well. Our Gozar, which is going to be in the next uh, virtual version of this system. Uh, Ezreal, along with others, are working to bring in the Gozar data. Uh, in this case, there's a lightning connection for cloud top temperatures. Uh, we have a direct readout, which brings in data quicker. Um, let's see what else. And that's also lightning there as well. So this system will be going in um, targeting in May. And then this is in beyond when we're talking about the RAP and the HER as a control member of the new ensemble, just as the next system, the NAMRR, this is the rapid refresh, uh, high resolution version of the NAM, where the nests are being extended from six kilometers in Alaska to three and from four kilometers to three in CONUS. Uh, the other nest, Alaska and Hawaii, are going to remain at three. They're, they're already there at three. Uh, this is to line them up with the high-res ensemble forecast uh, and the HER, so things will be at three kilometers. Also improvements to physics, uh, improved data simulation. Besides the hourly updating, we'll be bringing additional data uh, for uh, improved initial conditions. This is just an example of the impact of doing that, uh, very similar to what you would, you're getting with the RAP and the HER, and the use of the initial reflectivity and impacting the initial conditions, the, the, the initial placement of convection. So the next slide is a plan. I, this is where I wanted to spend most of my time because this brings up the most questions usually. So we're trying, the, the goal is to replace the deterministic uh, guidance suite, which is fairly disparate. Uh, it's probably one of the reasons that we get accused of having a too complicated system. Uh, and it was built to meet individual requests, and it has grown over the years. When, when I started as chief of the mesoscale branch, all I had to worry about was the NGM. Um, so what performance issues are being addressed? Well, there is a lack of uncertainty in guidance in the short range. Uh, there's a complicated production suite already in place for the regional. We want to try to simplify that a little bit. Upgrades to production take a lot of time. So as, as you'll see, the, my aggressive schedule, my giant leap, uh, is to overcome that. Uh, what changes are being made? Well, we're going to add a convection allowing scale ensemble that's more regular uh, and reliable and not made up of disparate pieces. Uh, we'll consolidate multiple components and have this aggressive schedule to uh, make it into the, the new Cray computer, the Task Order 4 computer, in late calendar year 2017 or the first quarter of fiscal year 18. Uh, what are we expected? It's going to use a fair chunk of that computing, but it was designed to do that. Uh, we briefed Louie on that back in March of 13, uh, and it is sized to fit the two petaflop machine. Uh, and it's consistent with the way forward white paper, which was put out in 2010. The, uh, the schedule, again, it's, it's driven by the fact that if we do things piecemeal, it's going to take forever. Uh, so in this sense, we're trying to uh, uh, bring together a large number of pieces and do the upgrade all at once. I see Becky back there uh, turning several shades of, of blue in the contemplating what this is going to mean. Uh, we would take this opportunity to turn off the DJX, which is an extension uh, that nobody really likes except Western Region. 
uh, and the high-res window, because it will essentially be replaced by the, the members of the ensemble in the high HRF. Uh, the plan also, a key part of this plan I propose is for continuity's sake, is that the control members for the ARW will look a lot like the RAP and the HER, and the control members for the NMMB will look a lot like the NAM, the NAMRR, and the NAM NEST. So for a time, we will be able to make all of the existing deterministic guidance from those control member runs. And I think in terms of making this transition palatable to our stakeholders, that's an important thing. Now, I think we also need to establish at some point with lots of discussion, a sunset date for these products uh, where they will no longer be available or they will be available as part of the entire ensemble from some uh, place like Nomads. Uh, this is a complicated slide. This is where this is across the top of the phases in time. So this, is, this was at the time what we were doing. Uh, this is what we should be doing by the end of, or the middle of 16, when the wrap uh, her upgrade is done as well as in the MRR, and then this is where we will hopefully be at the end of the WCOS uh, CRE period. Uh, the systems are known as Luna and Surge. Uh, it says 2.8 petaflops. That's the aggregate. The CRE, the, the Luna itself is about a 2 petaflop machine. So that's consistent with what we had briefed Louis on uh, back in March of 13. So we're talking about continuing to run the larger continental scale system, which we're going to call SHREP for continuity's sake, means a lot for people who don't have to change their setups in the field. Uh, and this is roughly about the same configuration as we have now, except that a good portion of their members will represent extensions of the convection allowing scale members, which will be an accommodate, accommodating of economy of scale, so the runs aren't going to be as expensive, uh, and it will take advantage of these higher resolution runs. And also, I've developed a, an alternating strategy, of basically to reduce the, the large cost of doing the convection allowing scale ensemble by alternating between uh, CONUS domain and Alaska domain, and, and hopefully we'll be able to accommodate either this time around or with the next computer, Hawaii and Puerto Rico ensembles as well. Okay, it's just about right. So, again, this is saying, uh, again, what I had said, the, the SREF continental scale will, will replace the 13-kilometer RAF, the 12-kilometer NAM, and the 16-kilometer SREF. And ultimately, when the, there's two things that are going to come into play fairly quickly. One is the national blend of models will move to shorter range and address the zero to three or one to three day one to four day time frame, and the efforts to bring the global in line to take over these functions will also be taking place. Now, until that function is, is met, we still need to run this scale of three and a half uh, or so Gui day, day guidance. Uh, it does provide the preferred guidance that SBC uses uh, for the pre-convective environment. Um, and also, periodically, we'll be running these to the longer range. And this part of it talks about the hourly updated pieces, which we used to call the NARI. Uh, and then the high res, the convection allowing scale uh, is done here. There's a web page that we built as part of the high res window uh, last. It, this system will subsume all of the, or replace, the high res window, except for Guam, the NAM nest, the NAM RR nest, which will be coming up with the MRR, the CONUS HER and the Alaskan HER, which would also either be coming in at the same time or uh, just prior. So these old acronyms are going to be retired, and periodically we'll be extending this to the longer range so that the SPC can turn off their SSEO, their Storm Scale Ensemble of Opportunity. Uh, this is a jigsaw puzzle which we're not supposed to talk about anymore, but that is what we showed to Louis back in March. I pulled out, oops, sorry. I pulled out just the regional pieces of that, and I've kind of rescaled it with the alternating strategy uh, here between CONUS and Alaska every hour. Uh, the, this, these are the control members for ARW and MMB. They would cons include hourly updated runs to mimic what is currently being done until we can get membership or the stakeholders to buy off on something different, like an alternating strategy, which saves lots of time. 
so they still have issues. This will represent a consolidation instead of having four complicated on, uh, implementations. Uh, we'll have one really complicated system. Uh, we still have issues with common output grids and delivery times. The grids, we hope, will uh, consent around the NDFD grids, which we need to produce anyway. Uh, and then also, oops, we don't need to look at that. That's a SHREF slide for Ricky uh, and others that shows that the SHREF uh, produces or misses truth less frequently than the guests. So until we can get this to be uh, roughly the same, it's going to be hard to turn the SHREF off. And I'm going to leave more time for questions at that point. Okay. Thank you very much, Jeff. Yeah. So time for questions. I see Steve. <laughs> Actually, hi, Peter. Jeff, thank you very much. Um, in your strategy of moving to two dynamical regional cores, what's the evidence that two is the right number and not one. Well, we find that we get, we get diversity with the existing system of using two dynamic cores for the, for the short range, more so than the current. So when, we, when we've looked at, when we say split the, the SHREF in half and look at the skill of one half versus the other half, usually our, for the most, stat, most of the stats, the combined system with two cores will give you roughly the same skill, but it gives you better diversity, better spread. So you encompass, like that last slide showed, you encompass truth uh, more frequently with that system. Um, is, can you imagine, or if you had sort of the science, which had good stochastic physics and whatnot as part of the package inside of a single core, that you could achieve that diversity with a single core? Absolutely. And, and I would envision that that single core and that concerted effort would be on the next generation global prediction model dynamic core, which will be non-hydrostatic. Non in the short term, we have the systems that we have today. That we know how to run them. We know what kind of diversity they provide, what kind of spread they provide. And what I'm trying to establish here, besides moving the enterprise away from deterministic, is a baseline that we can then use to get the evidentiary uh, decisions against. Please remember to mute your phone, please. Thank you. Hey, uh, Jeff Domingo, Bill Ward. Hey, Bill. Um, sorry, I didn't quite catch everything that you had thrown up there, but uh, the HRRR for Hawaii is coming when? Well, the, you already have the high-res window in Hawaii that runs both systems. The hourly updated capability would be coming in when, at, hopefully at this point. The question is how many members can we afford to run with the, with the Hawaii setup? And is it going to be run at the same resolution and time output as over the CONUS? Three, three, yes, it would be at three kilometers. Okay. Just as the NAM nest and the high-res windows are, are now. But we'll put it together into a single system. Quick one. Just a brief comment. Jeff, I can remember 20 years or so ago, you were a diehard determinist, uh, and you poo-pooed in Salma prediction. Man, you've come a long way. <laughs> yes, I was dubbed the deterministic wonk yeah. at, one, at an early meeting. But that, at the end of that meeting, though, Eric Rogers, at, at my request and our mutual agreement, put together the first short range ensemble based on NGM pieces and, and a myriad of initial conditions. Okay. So even though, even then I had leanings. All right, so there'll be uh, more time for Ask the Branch Chiefs tomorrow uh, late morning. Thanks, thanks, Jeff. And, and, oh, and the her E is no longer. HREF, HREF. Is the, is the acronym means the same thing, I think. No, oh, I think you've got it. Okay. Okay, we got uh, Bob uh, Grumbine, uh, and hopefully we got your slides up talking about the marine modeling and analysis branch. Okay, so I, I'm mostly uh, putting things up to 
um, advertise for the questions for tomorrow's Ask Branch Chief. Uh, one thing which occurred to me as I was uh, listening to the presentation uh, was we're looking towards an NGTPS era having six component modules for the uh, uh, global system. Three of them are from my branch. So uh, by way of uh, names and pieces, uh, Arun Chawla for, uh, okay, I lost where the point is. Yes, yes. Anyhow, Arun Chawla for waves, Avachal Mera on ocean, uh, me on sea ice and everything else plus branch issues. So we do like to hear from people uh, about what uh, what they're finding useful or otherwise from the models and where you want to go. Um, on the ocean uh, on the ocean side, uh, we have a large implementation which we're ready for, but uh, is uh, on hold until we can uh, synchronize with the Navy. The Navy has one more step before uh, they're ready to implement. So in the meantime, we've been running the model, and it's been uh, largely stable. Uh, of course, uh, law of nature it had an issue uh, a couple days ago, but uh, it had been very good for several um, several weeks before. So the here we're talking about a global system, any resolving ocean, and uh, very strong collaborations with uh, outside uh, uh, groups. Uh, and here's a, a few of the details on, on the system. So uh, uh, again, you can uh, follow this up. One of the uh, new uh, new aspects is that uh, there uh, there's actually something that they sea ice model uh, in the system, and it does lead to substantial improvement in uh, sea ice verification uh, scores. Um, and it's uh, part of the way to the full NEM NUOPSI. It's not all the way there yet, but uh, it is part of our uh, strategy for doing the um, um, eventual sampling. Um, so into the future, um, unwritten, a large fraction of the future work is actually the coupling to all the other systems. These are the uh, more predictable uh, physics elements, uh, improve the vertical resolution, coupling with uh, other items. Um, ICOM H4, we're, uh, we're still working, working that. The basin, uh, basin scale and uh, that's one of our points where we're going to be mining the uh, uh, UMAC report uh, and quarter degree seasonal to annual season, um, seasonal um, and to season uh, throughout. We're doing the usual uh, at this point convergence onto LEPKF uh, data simulation uh, that uh, that again is part of how we're going to be managing having the multiple uh, multiple system. So one, uh, uh, but that is at this point a research project. Closer at hand is the ENCODA system, already developed, so we don't have to do all this development again on our own, which is part of again part of the reason for speed and. Uh, should be coming online in, in, in your, in, well, mid-range at this point, uh, future. So for the waves, uh, yeah, it, uh, did not like the transfer, uh, which unfortunately I can never see. But the, the upshot is we do have a suite of wave models uh, which have been built around individual requirements needs and requirements. Some of this will be uh, declining. Uh, diversity will be de declining as we get uh, to coupled systems. One which is currently a uh, uh, 
question mark to be pursued is that at the moment the hurricane wave model, uh, which runs with uh, winds blended in from the uh, hurricane model, uh, as opposed to the uh, uh, regular global wave model, which is running only off the global uh, forecast system, uh, at this point it's not showing uh, substantial uh, skill improvement, which, raise, which raises the uh, uh, opportunity of retiring the hurricane run, specialized hurricane run, into one, coupling it to the, uh, coupling it in line to the hurricane model itself, and two, to just uh, let the global model that's of uh, equal skill uh, be, be the uh, guidance source. Uh, resolutions on the uh, on these are uh, multi-grid, so it's uh, regular grid, but uh, uh, increasingly fine resolution as you get to the coast. And the uh, as opposed to global wave ensemble, which is a, a, a standing half degree everywhere. The Great Lakes, uh, one of our uh, points of responding to field uh, requests. Uh, special Great Great Lakes wave model. It's been run for a number of years. This year went to two and a half kilometers. The uh, and project which is uh, standing up uh, probably January. The nearshore wave prediction system, where individual uh, forecast offices have their uh, uh, have a wave model guidance at very high resolution coming on to shore. And, uh, uh, and we'll run those on the map. A couple more details of our uh, implementations. Um, one uh, 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 standing issue is on the Great Lakes, and uh, also, and even more so perhaps for Alaska, is the ice cover. Uh, the Great Lakes provide a nice test bed uh, in that they're spatially limited and the National Ice Center does provide a, an analysis of the ice concentration over, over the lake. This year we're going to a higher resolution and, uh, uh, and hopefully uh, the Ice Center will be providing thickness information. In the Alaska region we don't have uh, we don't have those gridded uh, products at this point, so this is our uh, test bed. So a few more notes on our uh, physics. The uh, major major thing I'll, I'll draw up here is the uh, nearshore waves uh, should be going operational this January as a uh, demonstration of an on-demand system, uh, which is being run on the request and with the information from uh, the forecast offices. It's not simply a matter of uh, we have a schedule and we run these specific models at specific times. Um, over the next year, expanding our domain, uh, in particular the Arctic, will be fully included in the uh, global wave model. Um, currently, we stop at 83 North, which is dicey as climate changes and as the ice pack retreats ever farther north in um, in the summer melt season. Um, and point of we are listening to our uh, uh, field offices. The Great Lakes model uh, will be adding uh, hourly NDFE winds and dropping, uh, keeping our system load. Uh, more manageable, the NAND driven cycle. So, uh, and over the next year, after our pilot onto the eastern and southern regions, we'll be adding the rest of the coastal US. Uh, okay. So, in your turn, uh, I'll let you read these. Roughly speaking, more details. The big takeaway, though, is uh, moving to the coupled systems, moving to preparation for uh, coupling with NOS systems. So
So we're not just uh, working on the uh, coupling to the in-house models, but also our NOS partners. Uh, a couple uh, quick slides. One of the NGGPS uh, projects is a coupled Arctic system model, which is uh, baseline, starts with mesoscale coupled atmosphere, ocean, and ice, uh, and we'll be adding lakes and land uh, as soon as possible, basically. Uh, being mesoscale, we're looking at a few days time range. This is our test bed for figuring out how to do the three-way coupled system properly. Uh, Arctic being heavily uh, ice affected, this is a great place to test out your ideas on how to do the coupling. Once we figure it out, uh, then it becomes, because all of this is being done under the NEMS new OPSI, it becomes a relatively straightforward matter to expand to the rest of the globe. Uh, so a couple uh, old items, the sea ice uh, concentration analysis uh, that we've been doing for uh, many years is still, uh, uh, still a live item. Be adding uh, answer to ice, uh, which gives us some better support at high resolution for ice cover. And over the past year, uh, this actually addresses a longstanding issue we've had, uh, and Alaska region's been our prime uh, group pointing out the issue we have of occasionally bogus ice sneaks into the analysis and can stay there for an extended period. Finally, we found a way of dealing with that, and that is to use some ABHRR information <coughs> going outside the passive microwave that's used for the product itself. And that's uh, uh, been behaving well. And sea surface temperature analysis, the kind of short range item, uh, goes, not goes are, um, goes as the seas have been, uh, will be added in the next implementation. Coming down the line will be beers, answer to Himawari, as uh, We've also got a new climatology which should uh, uh, help us with areas that we don't observe for extended periods. And uh, new uh, processes for giving temperatures over the, uh, over the land, which is a problem as mesoscale models get ever finer, but the SSC analysis grid is still in its current 10 or so kilometer resolution, like 12 degrees. Uh, and Sam Benjamin, Jeff Domingo, and I have been uh, talked about these things for, for a while. Still hope to uh, get direct analysis everywhere. So, questions? Thank you, Bob. How far, Bob, how far along are you with this regional Arctic sea ice capability? Um, we are still hiring the ice person. So this is something that's uh, on its way. It's not something that we can show you an output for. Fair enough. So you might want to talk to Robin Webb at Ezra PSD. They already have a uh, Wharf ARW-based Arctic sea ice regional model that they're working on the Arctic test bed and have already produced predictions with. Uh, Janet Entrieri and Amy Solomon are the names that I know. Yeah, yeah that's them, yeah. Question for me. It is the same question, just for clarification, because that slide came after your slides in two to three year um, uh, priority. So, is that are you saying that Arctic uh, coupled model is a two to three year time frame, or is it different? It is uh, a point fifteen. I Two to three years was, that was referring to the time frame for the wave model uh, plan. The uh, uh, Arctic coupled system is a two-year project, uh, not two years into operations, but two years into something run, uh, running, providing, capable of providing information. Uh, Philip Chu from Noah Glarel. Got a quick question. So. For the model coupling for all the components, 
the typical practice is you coupled one component at a time, and then you do two-way coupling, then add another component. So in the plan, you have ocean, ice, atmosphere, and uh, wave together. Uh, are you going to couple all components at once, or if you do it individually, do you have any particular order or priority on the component? Thank you. The uh, uh, ocean ice is intrinsically coupled. You really can't do a proper uh, ice model without it talking substantially with the ocean. You can finesse a little bit the, the atmosphere. So in that respect, the first step is coupling two elements. Uh, the ocean, or the atmosphere is one component, and the ocean ice system has a second component. And once that is, uh, once we have that stood up, then uh, the waves will come in. Concurrently with that Arctic project on the coupling is the wave and ocean uh, coupling in the ice-free regions uh, is going to be getting developed. So, and concurrent with that, wave and hurricane. And concurrent with that, wave and atmosphere uh, in the global atmosphere effect. So it's not so much one after the other after the other in a particular arrangement as a parallel process of moving multiple uh, items forward. A direct last word here in this session. Just, just in response to what Ming was saying. So 16, uh, the goal is to have at least coupled uh, ocean, ice, atmosphere in a deterministic way. 17 is to build it out to an ensemble which allows us to run a specific product for the year of follow prediction. And as we are running that process, we'll decide how to operationalize that, whether this is a demonstration project to help us <coughs> build out the global models or whether this becomes a, 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 a regional model. We'll figure that out. But the, the goal is to do a demonstration of coupling and to do something for the year of follow prediction at the same time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bob. We'll move on to hurricanes. Uh, so we have uh, VJ uh, speaking about uh, H wharf. <laughs> Coast, coastal BJ. Be the coast of BJ. Coast of BJ, that's good. <laughs> okay, uh, I, have, I just noticed I have only 15 minutes, so I have to rush. Um, but anyway, you know, I, I wanted to continue where I left uh, last year and provided uh, this annual, uh, at the HF annual meeting, some of these plans, so I will revisit them um, until my replacement comes in, probably this will continue uh, my involvement. So uh, what I'm going to talk briefly about is uh, what we did in 2015 and uh, some of the unification plans along with uh, the future in terms of where we are going to head in the hurricane modeling area. So uh, in 2015, we went to two kilometers uh, near the inner core of the hurricane and also went global, all stop the ocean basin uh, in operation. And it has uh, more advanced uh, <coughs> physics as well as the data simulation upgrades. So uh, a, a snapshot from the operational uh, runs, uh, I think the date on July 11th looks like this, six storms running simultaneously, providing high resolution guidance for all those storms. Uh, and uh, as usual, we track the performance of the h wolf starting in 2011 all the way to 2015. There is a steady and systematic decrease in the track forecast errors as well as uh, in the intensity forecast errors. And you will see a major highlight for this year is uh, in the Atlantic intensity forecast, thanks to James Franklin who provided this figure, uh, the h wolf is the most skillful model for intensity predictions in the Atlantic. Not so much in the Pacific and the Western Pacific, uh, there were some issues there. Um, but we're also tracking the progress in terms of uh, the probability of detection of rapid intensification from uh, 4.8 to 44% in the Atlantic, a massive improvement. Although not so much, uh, but still there is an improvement in the Eastern Pacific as well from 1.2 to 5%. So that tells us the East Pack is still uh, a major uh, problematic area for predicting the rapid intensification. So we have been looking at uh, the PDF of the intensity itself for each basin now. We have five basins, Atlantic, East Pac, Central, Western Pacific, Indian Ocean. 
And uh, if you look at the uh, major hurricanes here, uh, there were storms that were of the 120 knot category, and Hitchcock was able to pick them up. Not so much in the Eastern Pacific. You can see the density of uh, uh, highly intense storms is much less in the Eastern Pacific compared to the observations of the West Track. Uh, in, the, in the Western Pacific also, actually, there is an over-intensification in the Western Pacific and also in the Indian Ocean. But in general, overall, in the global area, the distribution is pretty uh, impressive. Uh, in terms of 24-hour intensity change, which is also uh, a, a correspondence to uh, rapid intensification or extreme rapid intensification, uh, you see that in the Eastern Pacific, we were not able to capture those 40 to 15 not increase in intensity in, in just one day. Uh, in the Atlantic, we were able to get it nice. Uh, in the Western Pacific, uh, the RI forecasts were overdoing the intensity there, and also in the Indian Ocean. Uh, apart from the deterministic run, thanks to the support from the HPIP, we are running a multimodal regional ensemble and 20-member, uh, 3-kilometer HPIP ensembles driven by the global ensemble system is providing uh, forecast products for uh, the tracks and intensity. Uh, this is the typical uh, error spread relationship, uh, intensity. The errors are growing, but the spread is not, so it is still under dispersive. But this is for Hurricane Joaquin. You can see the ensemble mean was doing much better than the deterministic run. And uh, some of these products uh, are made available for the HP community as well as NHC. And typically, the ensemble mean has much lower errors than the deterministic run. So uh, with that uh, background, I'll quickly go through uh, the planned improvements for 2016. Uh, it will be still uh, three kilometers, but we will make some additional changes to the dynamics. The physics will be upgraded with the latest PBL from uh, GFS, and the ocean wave coupling is the major uh, effort here, a three-way coupled system. The H4 uh, that has uh, two purposes, one is to absorb the hurricane wave model that Bob was showing in his previous presentation, and also to uh, migrate towards uh, more realistic uh, ocean initial conditions based on HICOM. The data assimilation will continue its improvements with uh, implementation of uh, incremental analysis updates in the inner core area, and we have plans for producing new products, including a sustained wind swath. Uh, one additional change would be uh, eight storm added. Uh, right now, last year, I mean, in this year, we have seven storms, which will be increased to eight, and NSC will have a priority for all eight slots, uh, given the need. And if there are more than eight storms, then the human forecast will need to be involved in prioritizing. Otherwise, uh, I think this will cover both NSC and JTWC uh, pretty uh, satisfactorily. And this is the usual test plan that we produce every year. This is the uh, fourth year in the row. Uh, and uh, we have one new test that needs to be added because the GFS is being upgraded. So that will be a new test, testing the downstream model. And then individual upgrades, both the physics, the wave coupling, and a combination of it uh, uh, that results in the 2016 H4. Uh, very aggressive uh, timelines and testing schedules as usual. Moving on to the long-term plans, I have to focus on two, uh, actually three aspects. One is the status of GFDL. Uh, we plan to replace the GFDL model with the new NEMS-based uh, NMMD for hurricanes uh, by 2017 and uh, implement 10 member hedgehog ensembles by 2018 and move on to global to local scale under the NDGPS for 2020 and beyond. And in between, we have uh, plans to uh, implement a multi-scale, a uh, multi-storm basin scale, a tropical NMMB uh, for uh, continuity, and hurricane models take over the hurricane wave forecast. So these are the three major uh, plans. The NMMB uh, is uh, making good progress. We are uh, uh, testing it very aggressively, and uh, we have plans for uh, migrating or replacing the GFDL model by 2017. I would add that GFDL model will continue in operations in 2016 uh, with several major bug fixes for the conviction scheme that were found and uh, fixed, and significant improvements were expected, as uh, Maurice Bender would tell. And, and the NEMS-based uh, system would eventually take over the slot. And, uh, uh, the hurricane wave forecast, as I mentioned, will be coupled to the 
uh, initially one way coupled to the h4 system this year and eventually all the wave products coming out from hurricane waves across the globe will be provided by the hurricane model uh, when when it transitions into operation um, the the three way coupled system it's being aggressively developed the hp has supported the ocean model intercomparison tiger team that has uh, worked a lot in the last one year improving the highcom and also the el nino conditions in the eastern pacific have exposed uh, the limitations of the current operational form system where we were not able to represent the initial conditions more accurately in the in the nino conditions the, the double warm regions that that were not uh, helping the h of intensity forecast so i think uh, it's time to move on with more realistic initial conditions provided by artof either for the mpi form or the high com and this uh, uh, unification of the hurricane wave model will start in 2016 Uh, so the plans for ensembles, as I mentioned, we were experimenting them for the last three years. By 2018, we believe we can put a 10-member high-resolution H4 ensembles into operations, a combination of H4 and HNMMB, or eventually a single core with sophisticated physics uh, perturbations as well as the initial condition perturbations. And we are mostly focusing on developing advanced products. Uh, after talking uh, extensively with NSC, they need uh, more. Uh, information on how to use the ensembles for their for improving the deterministic forecast. That's the goal. Apart from providing the uncertainty information, so that would uh, eventually put us into uh, 2018 for an operational implementation. And uh, uh, there are uh, several collaborative efforts going on with HRD and DTC, uh, especially on the development of the basin scale as well as the tropical domain. NMMB can do a tropical channel model. Uh, negative 60 to positive 60 latitude, cyclic and longitude. That would uh, essentially replace all uh, individual single storm runs that H4 is doing right now, and also allow extending the uh, time of integration to seven and a half days, as requested by NHC to do the six and seven day forecast as well as the Genesis forecast. And uh, eventually, when the when the NGGPS is ready, the the new a uh, dynamic core with multiple mobile nets uh, can essentially replace the hurricane model um so uh, that that part exactly is repeated here and uh, uh, the continuous uh, improvements are anticipated with the physics in terms of both uh, hp and ngps strategies for improving the hurricane forecast improved hc interactions and in the inner core process are going to be the um, focus areas and uh, as we move forward with the multi scale interaction uh, the scale awareness will become extremely important apart from the three way uh, coupled system that requires individual components to be uh, accurately tuned or are developed for appropriate physics and this is how the prototype that we were demonstrating uh, a global model with multiple nets that can provide high resolution uh, hurricane forecast the data simulation uh, this year we are going with a two way coupling which both ensembles will provide the background error covariances apart from uh, adding the incremental analysis update and this will continue a focus area for improving the initial structure of the vortex for uh, uh, replacing the vortex initialization and and take it into account uh, everything in the inside the data simulation Uh, the NGGPS just one slide to show what the current existing capabilities are. MPAS has a mesh refinement, uh, static mesh refinement uh, facility available. NMMB we are developing a generalized nesting in, inside the NEMS that can be adapted either for MPAS or the FE3, which has its own uh, a two-way high-resolution nesting capability that was demonstrated as part of uh, the die cost selection and. Uh, so uh these conditions that we have mentioned here like uh, it has to support and very fast and efficient in terms of its execution all these will be uh shaping up the ngcps activities in the next 5 years to uh eventually get uh, global to local scale prediction for hurricane so in summary we're moving uh forward with uh, 2016 a possible update 2017 will have the basin scale uh, tested as well as the replacement for GFDL model with NMMB by team the basin scale along with the tropical domain 
uh, with a 10 member H-Work ensemble and eventually global to global. Thank you. I have a question from Miami here. It, it's Richard. Um, yeah, it, regarding the uh, testing of the uh, GFS, the 2016 GFS, and its impact on the H work. I think it's the second column of your um, of your 2016 um, plans. There, what's the um, what's the time frame? Uh, how to to do that? Because time is very limited. Are you going to try to do the three years and all that before the February deadline? The, the runs will start as early as the sufficient samples are available from the current GFS, actually. The plan is already in place. Uh, so over the holiday season, uh, by, I think by mid-January, we should have sufficient sample size. Okay, good. That's very important, you know, in helping drive the decision, our, our recommendation for the, um, for the GFS itself. Obviously, if we see, you know, the degra any degradations or significant degradations, that's, that would be a problem. So we need to know that. I yeah, think we've been over this. Absolutely, point noted. Uh, I think this is one of the, even before we create the baseline for 2016, that test would would have to happen with the current operational hedge for runoff of the new GFS uh, for all available samples by the time. I think we should be able to cover a majority of uh, the three-season testing. By the yeah, the three seasons really isn't that big a sample, so um, hopefully at least at a minimum you do that, and, and Sandy as well, I think. Sure. Thanks. All right, thank okay. you, Richard. Uh, let's go to Bill Ward. Uh, VJ, first of all, wow, that's loud. Um, thank you so much for uh, HWARF and all the work that all the folks behind the scenes are doing and everything else with that. Uh, I, we can't be happier with that. I mean, we've seen some intensity problems and, and then even resolution to uh, problems just as we had just about a week ago in the Southern Hemisphere were quickly resolved. So um, our hat is completely off to you. But I do have a comment to make to something that you mentioned in there. NHC has first priority to all eight slots. You mean, uh, yeah, that, that's correct. So well, that's, that's a design aspect. You don't need to really um, pay too much attention to the details. But, you know, if you go by what happened in the last 15 years, there were never uh, an occasion where there were more than eight stumps at any given time. Well, no, I understand that. I was just a little surprised to hear that. <laughs> yeah, but this is a this is a design aspect, not not so much of the choice. But uh, as as we all uh, know, this is a collaborative exercise, and definitely the NWSPR area is uh, of high priority when determining which storms to run in operation. Quick, quick remark, and then. The other thing is that, uh, and this is one of the things that's in the UMAC report too, UMAC report sort of asks why we are doing this, why we're running um, uh, in the Indian Ocean, things like that. And the short answer for that is uh, because there's not that much observation to begin with, so the more you run, the more you learn about all the systems. But having said that, the Weather Service only has a mission directly in the, um, in the Atlantic and in the East Pacific. And this, uh, this slide uh, saying that the Hurricane Center has as the first, uh, uh, yeah, we have we have a joint, we have we have we have the, the West Pacific is 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 uh, almost at that level, but not quite. The other ones are completely out of out of uh, out of our mission scope. Yeah, and so th this is just showing that even though we're running worldwide, we're still giving first priority to our missions. That that's the whole reason for doing this. So to follow up on that. Um, the Weather Service does have a mission in the Pacific, both north and south of the equator. Just throw that out there. Um, but my real question is on the Hurricane NNMB, is that going to be a global capability? That's the plan. Thank you. Okay, great. Th thank you, BJ. So our next speaker, uh, Pat Burke from National Ocean Service, NOS, is going to give us a, a quick update on some of their Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Patrick Burke, uh, Division Chief at, uh, over uh, Co-ops at the Center for Operational Oceanographic Products and Services. This is, we're really a, a partner to this. 
as opposed to working under the Weather Service umbrella, could you'll see in a couple slides here. But uh, I represent the operational end of all the belt work we do on the ocean modeling. Uh, but you know, there's also a, a huge uh, our sister office, the Coast Survey, on the development side working working these models. And as you'll see, it's it's larger even to, than that. There we go. So here's some just of our project project uh, programming objectives just to lay the, the baseline for what we're doing. So we're our, our mission is mainly navigation. Uh, so every time we go out and uh, develop these model domains, uh, we're trying to satisfy that customer. But as we see, there's emerging requirements coming through. And so as we as we're building this system now, we're trying to enable other types of fore forecasts. The second bullet here, you know, this integrated total water prediction. I'm looking, uh, you know, very interested what Bob was talking about with uh, What's going on in the wave wave field as well as in storm surge as well. Um, this emerging uh, roadmap effort, you know, uh, with ecological forecasting as well, to also allow them to kind of uh, work with us, uh, leveraging our modeling capabilities to kind of produce some of the products they're trying to get to. And then again, on the on the emergency manager situation, you know, oil spill, uh, that type of, that type of modeling is also integrated into our approach. Um, we're still we're still kind of new in this, you know, compared to the weather service. So we're 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 really going through a lot of our first generation of our models. As we're doing this, we're trying to uh, with our upgrades, we're trying to really improve our efficiency. So there's we're we're continuing to refine our modeling approach as as we go through this system. And then it, obviously we have a, a, a level of performance to try to meet to make sure that we're providing the best products possible to our navigation customers. So as I said, this is a partnership. You know, you know, we we have an agreement with the weather service to. Be, uh, leveraging their infra supercomputing infrastructure to run, run our models here, but really, you know, it's, it's these other three bubbles here, you know, us on the operations side, uh, Coast, Coast Survey developing uh, the model system, not only for uh, uh, for our, our, our OFS systems, but also on the storm surge side as well, which I'll talk to in a little bit. And then we're really starting in this collaborative approach, uh, you know, working with other lines like OAR, but also uh, with IOS and, and Academia as well to kind of... <coughs> Uh, develop these systems in a, in a faster uh, type environment. And so we do we do use a lot of community model development out there. We don't develop our own code here. And, and so we work with Rutgers and, and UMass and uh, UNC Chapel Hill uh, to, to, to depend on them to get our, our modeling systems on the ground. So this is just a, a, an oversimplification of what we're trying to get to. We're not here yet, uh, but this gives you an idea. We are trying to establish coverage across CONUS. Um, we, we do have a lot of, it's almost like a, a scattershot approach right now. We have we're, we have capabilities in a lot of these estuaries, but we really need to, to get accelerate our efforts and, and, and try to get complete coverage. And so we have a lot of efforts going on, which I'll talk to you in my next slide, but on the West Coast and in the Gulf and in the lakes, uh, we really need to start merging these capabilities, learning from all these things to get to uh, a complete, a complete coverage of the coast. <clears throat> so where are we going? So this, so this, this uh, past year, the slide I showed. In 15, we we uh, we developed our, our five-year plan or our, our new strategy for for coverage across across the nation. And in 16, we're really starting to implement it. And, and so we're coming in uh, with our first lake upgrade, uh, working with OAR in uh, Laurel, uh, as well as as working with IUS on a new capability uh, in New York Harbor, which. It's a credit to what we're trying to get here in terms of fostering this collaboration, and then coming through very quickly in 17 and 18 are, are some of some of some needed uh, efforts we have not only in Cook Inlet, you know, our first uh, Alaska regional model, and then starting to work more on these regional approaches in the West Coast, working with uh, our partners uh, Nesdis, and again in uh, some of the RAs out on the West Coast to get to get some of the capabilities. I, I'd like to point out that this Tampa Bay uh, Marine Channel forecast is a uh, is an integrated work, uh, effort with the, with the Weather Service to provide a, a combined atmospheric and marine channel uh, forecast. Uh, the first of its kind, the pilot that started in the Weather Service in Tampa Bay, and we're, we're bringing it over to to NOS uh, as the final home. So, quickly talking on storm surges again. You know, uh, my office we oversee more of the uh, OFS effort, the uh, uh, Jesse's group over at. Uh, CSDL, they've been looking over the storm surge modeling efforts. Um, right now, we have capability on the east and west coast, uh, and east, you know, around the Hawaiian Islands. We're also they're also starting to develop a capability in our territories out in the western uh, Pacific. 
um, where they're going. Uh, in 16, uh, they're going to deliver uh, hurricane surge on-demand forecast system, you know, trying to get more of the tropical uh, surge prediction needs we're, we're resolving. It, it's initiated by the hurricane center, so it's going to be an on-demand uh, system, you know, as, as the hurricane approaches. So we'll see this, I believe, in quarter three coming coming down the pipe. So here, here are some of our needs. You know, I would even caveat saying our long-term needs continue to drive even our short-term needs. But we're, we're just uh, getting our feet wet in terms of data simulation. We have a, we have an opportunity. Uh, we have a, uh, a model right now that covers the entire West Coast, uh, from uh, Vancouver all down to, to Baja. And with that, we're looking at data, data simulation, really working with community develop community modelers out there. Uh, to learn from expertise and bring that capability into our modeling environment. Um, we really need data. Uh, as I said, we have a, a set of standards uh, that when we, we provide our, our forecast to the customer, they want to know how, how, how well are we doing. So there's a huge dearth of observations uh, out in the coastal environment, especially on the density side for salinity. Uh, and so we're continuing to work with, with, with people to, to identify those needs. Uh, I talked about the integration of, of forecast products. You know, this is a pilot down in Tampa, but I think quickly from there we'd like to continue to work with, with local WFOs to see where we can uh, continue to, to grow that, that product. And again, as Bob was talking, uh, you know, interest in nice modeling. Right now we have a, a project in the lake we're trying to uh, investigate and then see how that, again, goes out to the Arctic. And so I think that's where there's a huge interest. In terms of the long-term needs, as I talked to at least our five-year plan, uh, going forward, trying to get to complete geographic coverage, and then also working on this whole water prediction effort, you know, continue to work with the water center as, as it gets up and running, uh, trying to link the river to the coast, the system we're working with the forecast, well, with the forecast centers, the river forecast centers to do that. And then this emerging requirement, uh, not only with eco-forecasting, but also biogeochemical modeling, you know, social acidification, uh, other, other things of that nature that we're trying to investigate once we get the West Coast model implemented, that would be the next thing. <clears throat> so, so some of the challenges then in trying to meet these needs. Uh, you know, we talked to, the, to uh, observations being available to help, you know, not only with our validation of our models, but also in terms of that data simulation to improve our forecast once, once we have these models implemented here. Uh, trying to uh, figure out how to better address these requirements coming from uh, the eco-forecasting world, and uh, then towards the physics, trying to resolve some of the phenomena we're seeing as well as, you know, and that comes with as well getting uh, better force and conditions in our model. You know, we use GR top, the NAM, and, and the FD in a lot of our places, but I think, you know, working with the river forecast centers, you know, trying to improve some of the physics that are going in to, to, to improve our model and initial conditions will go a long to do that. So what is needed? Um, so I'm beating the drum here, data, data, data. Uh, if, we, if we can find out better ways to get that, not only to, to identify, but then also trying to work that into the data tanks here so we can use that uh, to, to run our model. Uh, seamless access with, with, with WFO products. Uh, we're, we're running into a little bit of difficulty right now in Tampa Bay, but I think continuing that communication and working closer with with the branch chiefs, Becky's group, and, and so on, I think we're, we're on the right path forward there. Um, standard products coming out for river forecasts right now. Uh, it, it, run, it runs the game in, in terms of what's available at the forecast centers. Um, I, hopefully with the water center coming up, we're, we're going to get to this level of standardization uh, to help then improve our, our river forcing conditions into our, into our model environment. With all this, you know, comes, you know, we're, we're these emerging emission requirements, we're going, to have, we're going to be looking to see if we can get some additional super community resources to support, support these requirements as well. And then my, my last point here is there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things going on. Con, you know, WCOS continues to continually be updated. Um, we, are, we are, as everybody else, short-staffed. And so trying to get out ahead of this, trying to communicate early and often so we can account for that in our resourcing to make sure that we're, we're working with, with NSEP and to meet meet these goals and, and, you know, to be accountable in doing that. I think that's it. Yeah, questions? 
Joe Sinkowitz from uh, Ocean Prediction Center. I, I'm glad, Patrick, I'm, I'm glad to hear you mention about the density issue and salinity, is that we're working uh, with NOS, the Oxford Lab, to uh, basically enable a uh, pathogen prediction uh, uh, effort for both Chesapeake Bay and uh, Delaware Bay. And uh, each summer we've seen a significant drift in salinity to the point where we've, we've pulled uh, 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 displays off of uh, uh, for sea nettles and for pathogens uh, off of the web until we can basically correct things. If, with the, with, if the West Coast were successful in data simulation, my question is how quickly do you think that the other operational forecast systems could be adapted? That's a good question. Uh, so I, I, would, I would say this. Uh, it's really a parallel effort. There's a lot of there's there's a lot in in terms of data simulation. There's a lot going on. Um, we we have a uh, we're able to be working with, with with the regional communities out there on the west coast to bring in uh, to investigate this capability on the west coast, which is a large region. In terms of the estuaries and that approach, we are working with with UMSIS and and, and uh, through JPSS. Also, uh, we had an opportunity through. Uh, through Nessus as well to be looking and investigating Chesapeake Bay as, as a parallel path. Uh, we could have this capability in a couple of years. I, I'm, the West Coast, the West Coast as it is, is slated for 18. I would say right behind it, probably in 19 or 20, we would we would be able to do this. But in, in the short term, uh, we are trying uh, to look at other means besides data simulation to improve those forecasts. And I think looking at initial conditions, improving uh, what's going into our models, I think would, would also help with that. Uh, other questions. Uh, here we go, Ricky. Um, now, Ricky Rude with the UMAC, I guess. Um, the word seamless in that last slide, this link, seamless access, is, is one of those words that raises an old management red flag with me because I've seen a lot of things go down a seamless path. Is what really needed there is that sort of standards and, and, and uniformity and services that are needed there such that you have a stable interface or or is it something more than that is it, is this is this a place where if you start to look at the connectivity across products that attention to those standards and services um, would would have a high impact <laughs> I'll try not to push this one. Um, what we've seen is it's, as, as we move from, from place to place, the same rules don't hold. So, you know, working with one WFO or, or working at the corporate headquarters here, it, it would be better if we can find a way to, to go, go to one source, one facility to, to get our forecast instead of working, working the chain as we're, as we're doing. So it does hold up a lot of pro product development here. Um, so I think I think first and foremost would be just to kind of standardize that approach and, and, and like a common one entry point would probably be a, a lot more helpful as opposed to many heads attacking this issue from different different areas. Come back a year later um, to the same group that they are likely to have changed how they're doing it. Right. And I, and I think we're we're on a good path forward. I think it's continue that communication. Final question? Okay, we'll move to the lawn time scale here. So, uh, Suru with uh, the climate program, climate hey. aspects here. Um, my name is Suru Saha. I work in the climate team at EMC. There are a lot of people here that are working on the couple system, and I just put it as comprehensive as I could. I'd like to just highlight a few people who are working with us in the University of Maryland, Daryl Sykes and Steve Penny. I just wanted to acknowledge them. Um, so, a good prediction system incorporates both a good data simulation system and a good forecast model. They go hand in hand. You can't separate them when you're actually building a full complete system. So, uh, what we want to do is build a prototype of the next generation of the unit unified global couple analysis and forecast system, which we're loosely calling the UGCS. Uh, or we could call it something like Earth Next, or just the Dreamliner. But 
So uh, starting with data simulation, um, we really in the long run want to come couple of the atmosphere, the land, the ocean, the sea, ice, waves, chemistry, ionosphere. Right now, the climate forecast system has coupled four of these components, the atmosphere, land, ocean, and sea ice. We're going to add three more. The data simulation cycle uh, this is very loosely based on what Hendrik showed. Um, in a unified system, you start with data simulation, and oh, these are just projections. They're not cast in stone, of course. Um, looking at a 10-kilometer resolution, um, uh, 100 ensemble members, testing regime would be three years, the retrospectives and the upgrade frequency maybe once a year, and going into actionable weather, or what we call weather forecast, out to 10 days, resolution also 10 kilometers. Um, and then going into the sub-seasonal forecast, out to six weeks, the Resolution could decrease to 30 kilometers, maybe 20 member ensemble per day, and the upgrade. And we will have to do a reanalysis and reforecast, probably from 1999 to the present, which would give us about 20 plus years, and the upgrade frequency of two years. And finally, for the seasonal forecast, maybe going out to nine months, which we do presently, but if there are requirements, we may go out to uh, a year or even 15 months. The resolution uh, out to 50 kilometers, right now we are at 100 kilometers, and the ensemble vendors may be 40, and the reanalysis regime would have to probably go back to 1979, and the upgrade frequency probably four years. Again, nothing's cost in stone, this is just the initial projection. Okay, so the predictions for all spatial and uh, temporal scales will be ensemble based. There will be a continuous process of making couple reanalysis and reforecasts for every implementation, whether it's weather, or seasonal, or seasonal. And since the resolution of all parts of the system is usually increased with every implementation, that's what we do, in proportion to the increased um, computer file, it is always, we're looking into the possibility of exploring cheaper cloud computing and storage options for making these reanalysis and reforecasts, because they don't really have to go into the production um, computers. They could be done elsewhere. Um, first, for the proof of concept, for the atmosphere, we will take whatever improvements or, um, you know, um, the, the, the atmospheric data simulation group. We have a very vibrant and healthy data simulation group here at, uh, at EMC. And so we, right now, are looking at a hybrid 4D ENVAR approach with an 80-member ensemble, uh, which would be coupled forecast and analysis with semi Lagrange dynamics at the present. We don't have the new DICOR, and maybe 128 levels in vertical. Remember, this is a prototype. It's a toy. It's, not, it's the first approach to getting a unified system. So what we do is, instead of waiting for things to happen, we're trying to put together a system with whatever we have right now. It is, again, not the end system. Um, the ocean, we have GFDL's MOM 5.1, we have GFDL's MOM 6, as, and or, as you've heard, uh, we have HICOM in house as well. Uh, sea ice, we have SIS2, which is the sea ice model from GFDL. We have CIC, which is the CIS model from Los Alamos, and KISS is something we're developing in-house. Aerosols, we have go-kart. Waves, we have WaveWatch 3. Land is NOAA land model. There are lots of improvements in all of these. And the ionosphere is a whole atmosphere model up to 600 kilometers. Now, all of these are being developed by other groups at AMC. So this is really emerging of six or seven different groups coming together here. Not been done before, it's very challenging. Um, and this is all being done under NEM. So the basic unifying infrastructure is going to be NEM. It's, and it is being built to unify the operational systems in a single framework. And to, in order this, we can more easily share common structures and components and expedite into operability. So one by one, all of these models are going to be brought into the NEM infrastructure. And right now, we have the initial delivery from the NEMS group of GFDL's MOM 5.1, CIC, and GSM 
right now, which is the operational DSM. So, and, and, and then our working with and GoCard is, is available and tested that as yet. Uh, WaveWatch is being developed under the NEMS architecture, and so is the neural line model. So, slowly but surely, we're moving all this system together under NEMS. This is a, just a, a diagram of a couple of hybrid data information and forecast systems. Under NEMS, we would have the uh, different components making a couple of ensemble forecasts. And then these are a couple of ensemble forecasts. Uh, members would go into the data simulation system. At this point, they are separate. We're testing it as a separate system for the atmosphere, the wave, the aerosol, the ice, land, ocean. And then they each make use this input and, and give analysis output, which then goes back as initial space into the NEMS system. This is just a little picture. So, um, made a, I'm not touching much from the atmospheric part because um, Vijay did that. But basically, I just wanted to say that everything that we're doing here in unified system has to be scale aware. That's the key word, scale aware. That means we have to improve, for instance, the treatment of deep contraction by introducing a unified parameterization that scales continuously between the simulations of an individual cloud where the grid spacing is sufficiently fine and the behavior of conventional parameterization where the grid spacing is very coarse. So for the short range, you have very fine resolution, and then for the long range, you have a very coarse resolution. And the convection should know this, should be able to be scalable and go seamlessly from one um, grid spacing to the other. And so that's the big the trust of, of most of the physics um, that's being done right now. Improve the representation of clouds, really, micro physics, etc. And there are many approaches being, uh, being followed at the ESP on this. Radiation is extremely important for clouds. Actually, it's important for all scales, especially for clouds. And uh, we're also looking at aerosols, both indirect and direct effects. The main thing you want to take away from here is you must have consistent clouds, convection, radiation, and microphysics. They have to be done in, 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 a, in a total uh, atmosphere. You, you cannot do people's in convection and radiation and microphysics separately. You have to have them all working together. And that's what this approach is going to be. They have to be working together on all of these fours to be able to get physics that is scale aware. And there's other things like gravity wave drag, um, especially the non-stationary propagated type, because this is, as ECMW shows, is very important for the stratosphere in, in, in the proper simulation of the QBO. So um, methodology. Um, we're really going to go very fast. This is the land surface. You can read it. We, they are um, uh, talking about improving the NOAA MP, um, going to the NOAA MP with dynamic vegetation, canopy, all of the different things that they are. Uh, again, these are different groups at EMC working with them, just got slides from all of them. Um, they are also looking at new land surface data um, uh, upgrades, um, bringing much more observational database and satellite databases into the data simulation system. Then we have the aerosols, and they, that's the go card, and they, the methodology upgrades um, using the hybrid DA system to simulate especially um, satellite-based smoke emissions uh, for organic carbon, black carbon sulfate, and they will be using these from MODIS and uh, from, from the 2000 to present for the EOS era. Sea ice. Among the toughest problems is the analysis of sea ice. Um, we have had hot, really, variations in the extent and thickness of the sea ice in both the polar regions. The modeling of sea ice, shelf ice, sheet ice, glacial ice, they all need to improve. And special attention has to be given to the coupling of sea ice to fresh water from the atmosphere and continental runoff and its interaction with the meridional over turning currents in all of the ocean basins, especially the North Atlantic and the marginal seas like the Mediterranean and the Baltic. So there's a lot of work that's going on in both the data simulation and modeling of sea ice. And then you have the wave coupling. Again, this is just touching on all of the work that we're doing. You have the atmosphere, you have the waves, and you have the ocean. And there's a two-way coupling between each of these and the other. And right now, we are systematically going through one-way coupling, and then the 
two weeks. Please remember to yes. mute your line. Thank you. A lot of this work has never been done at least at EMC or even anywhere else. So we have to work with other groups to get these things in. Mm -hmm. And um, finally, um, in the wave, um, modeling a wave, um, you have to have a couple, drive the wave model in couple mode with atmospheric wind, and then they include the wave ocean coupling, the current from the ocean <laughs> model to the wave model. And this is more important, the wave induced land mimics and going back into the ocean. Okay. Right now, the atmosphere wave is, is, is being developed, but we also have to develop the wave ocean. <laughs> and then the DNA simulation, uh, for the analysis, um, we want to use spectral data from ocean buoys and the satellite data from altimeters. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we have to understand is that we have the atmospheric part of the data simulation is well established. Mm -hmm. with lots of new data coming in. For the other components of the system, we need to do a lot more data mining, and we haven't used lots of sources of da new data. And so this is going to be one of the thrusts to, to start um, actually getting a database ready to for simulation, reformatting the data, and so on. The operational CSSR, this is the climate forecast that's from reanalysis, uses a couple of ocean, atmosphere, land, and sea ice forecasts for the analysis background. But as I said, the analysis is done separately for each of the domains. So the next analysis or analysis the goal is to increase the coupling so that the ocean analysis will affect the atmospheric analysis, and so on. And this will be achieved mainly by using a couple of ensemble systems to provide the background and the E and K have to generate structure functions that extend across the atmosphere ocean interface. And um, work is being done on these at the European Center and other places. The same can be done for the ocean and uh, atmosphere and land and with the other components as well. And we hope this will improve the soil temperature and the soil moisture content. I have several questions, sir, so they can cut me off if other people want to ask questions, and I'll raise them tomorrow in the branch chief uh, discussion. So. Looking at this timeline, um, January 22 upgrade using the semi-Lagrangian core, then assuming that we can actually do the next upgrade as opposed, as opposed to seven years and four years, we're going to lock in the semi-Lagrangian core until 2026. Mm -hmm. I'm not done with the question. Sorry, it's a little background. So um, in six months, we're going to know, is the future going to be MPAS or is it going to be the GFDL FB3? Perhaps we should wait until that time before we start. I appreciate this is sort of a schematic because if the GFDL model gets adopted, it has a huge infrastructure in terms of ocean analysis and ENKF uh, and various other features that may modify this timeline. Is that a fair statement? Oh, okay. Do you want me to answer that? Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> um, we're not locked into anything. What we did, as I said at the beginning, we're just taking what we have right now, which is the semi Lagrangian dynamics, that's all we have. But as soon as the NGGPS makes up its mind which one they want to go to, we will move to that. What I'm trying to say here is this is just a prototype of what will be the end. So we're really not locked into anything. Secondly, this is more of a prototype of the data simulation system. And the data simulation system really if to some extent doesn't really care, it needs a couple of background gas. What we have right now is a semi Lagrange that provides, that could provide a, a, a couple of gas to, to further advance a couple of data simulation systems. So, in, again, in that sense, nothing is really cast in stone. It's a toy that we're just using whatever we have right now instead of waiting for, you know, for parts to come in. We can begin at least with the data simulation system. It really just doesn't, you know, it needs a couple of forecasts. You could take it from a couple of models, any couple of models. Sure. So, um, so going to a point that Bill raised and Ricky raised, so I think, and again, I appreciate it, appreciate the effort, a lot of great and exciting science here. We still have to have the interaction with the stakeholders in terms of what we prioritize to inform the plan, and I look forward to those discussions. Definitely. Absolutely. Okay, one more, one more here from uh, Jim Kenter on the UMAC. 
Uh, hi, sir. Jim Kinter, uh, Cola and Umec. Um, two quick questions. One, um, you mentioned three different sea ice models. Can you uh, tell us what's driving development of the in-house sea ice model that's different from the other two? And the other question is the, um, the uh, aerosol component. You said there was an interactive aerosol component in RRTMG, but there's also NGAC, which is the chemistry aerosol interactive prediction component. So are those, uh, are they distinct? Are they independent? Are they coupled? Are they redundant? Um, what's, what's the plan? With KISS, um, I'm going to give it over to the KISS generator. So the, uh, yeah, the CI uh, project. The uh, uh, driver for the in-house is that in looking at the uh, couple of models that uh, ha have been run, uh, bring our focus up down from the climate scale, and by climate I, I mean the decades, which is um, uh, has been the, the focus for uh, CIS model development for the past forever. Uh, coming down to the days time scale and saying, does this be persistence? Uh, the answer ha has been coming back no. And for days time scales, I don't believe that we can really accept a model that does not be persistent uh, as a coupled system. Uh, so that's one leg of the genesis of the uh, KISS model, which, by the way, stands for keeping ISA's simplicity. There are some aspects of the system which are uh, pretty simple. That said, uh, th in February there, there will be a meeting uh, hosted by the DTC to uh, uh, be addressing just how more formally we, we can and should be going about uh, selecting CIS models because with three, that, that does mean we've got a significant uh, contribution. The community, CIS community, actually has rather more than just those three and uh, if given the lack of history, really, of uh, CIS models for weather timescales, it seems presumptuous to think that the, uh, uh, the three listed are uh, necessarily going to address the weather problem the best. Folks are getting hungry, but uh, oh, second uh, question, and then we'll go to Ricky, and that's it. Their lunches are waiting. Hendrix answering the second question. So, so on, on the aerosol side, the the bigger issue is the fact that we have to figure out how long the NASA will support go-kart and if they keep doing that. And that's going to drive what we're doing. And in, in that same session, uh, you mentioned <coughs> there's uh, uh, possibly uh, <laughs> either MPAS or FE3. We're not taking the whole models. So we're really taking the core. And we're doing the core only because that allows us to cut down the transition time to a new model on the global, on the atmospheric side by many, many years. And so uh, if that core comes available, then there's no reason to stick. If, if it's available in time, there's no reason to, to stick it in here before you start running actual um, uh, uh, the production of the reforecast and reanalysis if, we, if we're early enough with that. But it also means that we can learn from what, for instance, the FDL has done on the climate side. But because we don't completely pick up the model but pick up the core, we have to be very careful how we do it engineering-wise. Um, so if you go back to your last chart, your, your, your time, and, and the, then the question that came from over here, um, I, I think this is a, and I'm going to ask Jim Kenter to correct me if I'm incorrect, um, I, I think this is a case where the sort of culture change that we're talking about comes into play here. I think what you've done here is, an exercise of planning that's very valuable. But if you look at things such as the NIMS and the NIMS coupling environment, what that allows you to do is to have substantial flexibility to couple models much more rapidly than has been done in the past and to take those models to testing much more rapidly than has been done in the past which gives you flexibility in a controlled environment to actually be adaptive on these timescales rather than you're now committed till January 20th. 
I mean, this... Oh, I'm dead. It's kind of scary. It looks scary, but if this, if NEMS weren't there, and if we weren't testing in the NEMS environment, this would go way out there. I mean, the fact that we have to freeze the system somewhere in, you know, 18, 19 time frame is because we would... Because of them, we would be able to test all of these systems. They're coming online right now, pretty fast, actually. And so, even though what we get from the NEMS group is, a, a, you know, a, a, a model, we still have to test it with yeah, the GSM atmosphere. We have to test different combinations. We have to test data simulation. But that process is much faster now. I mean, I've realized that that when we got the first initial delivery, yes, we've got 5.1, but we can test MOM6 pretty easily because Mediator is very close, apparently, to MOM 5.1. So, yes, I mean, I think it's going to be... With the danger of keeping you away from your lunch, there's one, one thing that we didn't highlight here, but this is really much more important than that even. So, by 19, we basically have the whole system in place. We just run production. And so, unlike what we did before, uh, we, uh, we, um, where, where we would have a full CFS program stop that, take a deep breath, take a vacation, and start a new process. In 19, January 19, we start the development of 3.4. So it is going to be, although the, the process itself takes roughly seven years, once we're getting into this project uh, cycle and this project management cycle, the, the project may take seven years, but parts start to overlap. So the seven-year project will result in a four-year implementation cycle, hopefully. Next time. And that's uh, next time. And so... So that's that's going back to this forward planning. It's going back to the to to the project management side, and uh, <coughs> this is basically what our our, uh, our users have asked. Uh, we need a much faster upgrade of the CFS. Fortunately, since we're starting from uh, a fairly uh, fairly uh, cold start here, it won't happen right now. But after this implementation, we should be in a position to run a overlapping but much more faster update cycle. And with that, go get your lunch, come back at 125.